Yes, we keep adding. We can do that. We have a magic band. All right. Well, good morning. Won't you stand with us? We are going to worship our Lord. And it's not to us that be the glory, but to Him alone. He is worthy of our praise and glory. So won't you join with us? Let's join our hearts together, Lord. We praise you. We say not to us, but to you alone be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. safe harbor and as we come to worship uh, our God together. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to 1 Corinthians 6 uh, verses 19 through 20. 
It's good to be here with you all. If, let me just mention, if you have any prayer requests or if you're visiting with us, we would love to connect with you. You can uh, fill out this card in front of you, drop it in the offering box on, the, uh, on uh, your way out, and we would love to pray for you or connect with you if you're visiting with us to just uh, let you know a little bit more about what the Lord is doing here at Safe Harbor and to find out more about you. Uh, we're continuing uh, through the book of Ezekiel in our sermon series in Ezekiel today. We've got one more week, so hang in there. I know it's been a big book to tackle, uh, but I've enjoyed studying it, and we, we're going to see really a pretty amazing end uh, to this book that God is revealing uh, to us in the way that we have, or what we have to look forward to in the future. So 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verses 19 through 20, uh, God's word says this. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. And one of the reasons we read this passage to open our time together is today in Ezekiel 40 through 46, we're going to see a picture uh, that God gives of a new temple. A, pi a picture that he wants us to understand uh, and think about when it comes to following him and worshiping him. And what we see in the New Testament right here is that God has made us temples in Christ of the Holy Spirit. God lives in us. And so we have a responsibility as God's people where God lives in us to glorify him. And so we, that's what we're going to see uh, kind of play out. We're going to see a lot of imagery a lot of things that God wants us to understand about what it means to, to be in his presence in the temple and how we should then live as a result. And so let's go to the Lord, um, asking him to be with us and meet with us today. Father, we are humbled to be in your presence. Lord, the, the fact that in Christ that we are made temples means that we are with you and that your presence is with us. Even now, as we gather for worship, we know that you are here among your people. And we pray, Father, that you would be glorified through the things that we say and do, the songs we sing, the words we say here. Lord, you have made us your own. You have bought us with the price of your son so that we could be your temple. Lord, help us to not take that lightly, but help us to glorify you and to strive to glorify you with our lives. Lord, be honored today among us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We just remain standing. Let's worship our Lord. Let's think about how marvelous and wonderful he is.
introduced this song uh, to us as a congregation last week. We're going to sing this again. Sing of his gospel and his amazing love and grace.
good morning. I hope your hearts are prepared this morning and as we've been worshiping and realizing that uh, Christ is over all. And uh, that should give us hope this morning that is above all else that we see going on in the world. And this morning, let's keep that in mind as we continue on in Ezekiel. Uh, if, uh, open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 40. And we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read a few verses here as Pastor Andy's going to preach through some chapters. Um, Ezekiel chapter 40, starting in verse 1. Let's hear God speak this morning through his perfect and holy word. In the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, In the fourteenth year, after Jerusalem had been captured, on that very day, the Lord's hand was on me, and he brought me here, brought me there. In visions of God, he took me to the land of Israel and set me down on a very high mountain. On its southern slope was a structure resembling a city. He brought me there, and I saw a man whose appearance was like bronze, with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. He was standing by the city gate. He spoke to me, Son of man, look with your eyes. Listen with your ears and pay attention to everything I am going to show you. For you have been brought here so that I might show it to you. Report everything you see to the house of Israel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, in whom we trust and who we worship. Lord, thank you for this passage from Ezekiel, where we hold your word high and we believe that it is truth. And we believe that it is something that we can follow and learn from and, and grow in. And something that we can mold our lives by. So Lord, change our hearts this morning. I pray that the Holy Spirit will work a miracle this morning in people's lives. We know that you're all powerful and you can do anything. So this morning, Lord, we cry out to you. Lord, uh, humble us. Help us to see what it means to live in your presence. How should we live in your presence, knowing who you are? What a blessing it is to hold your word in our hands and know that because of what Jesus has done for us, that we can live in your presence and that you live within us. Make that real to us this morning, Lord more real than anything in our lives. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, if you are an elementary age student and you would like to go downstairs to your class, you can follow your teachers out the back door and learn about Peter and Cornelius. And if you have your Bibles, leave them open. We're going to work our way through Ezekiel 40 through 46. And let me just say, if you haven't read this beforehand, I encourage you to read it later on today uh, because there's a lot of details that I'm not going to be able to to cover every single detail. But we are going to see some big ideas here that God's going to show us. And let me just read again uh, what Pastor Chad just read from Ezekiel 40 uh, and in verse 4. Because I want this to be, uh, what us to receive this as what God is saying to us, all right? He spoke to me, son of man, look with your eyes, listen with your ears, and pay attention to everything I am going to show you. And I pray that that is the way that we are approaching right now, approaching God and his word with this expectancy, knowing that God wants us to look, to hear, to pay attention 
because God has words for us. God wants to speak to us today, just as he spoke to Ezekiel, just as he showed Ezekiel some glorious things about who he is. God wants us to see that today. You know, oftentimes uh, when we start uh, new missions partnerships, uh, one thing that's usually good to do is to take what is called a vision trip. Uh, in, on a vision trip, uh, usually a church will send uh, a team or a few people to meet with a missionary that lives in the city where they're trying to plant a church or trying to reach people who don't know Jesus, who don't know the Bible, who don't know who Jesus is. And so the, this team goes and they meet with this person in the city. The person shows them around, uh, shows them what, what the city looks like, kind of the lay of the land, and really kind of communicates the vision, the heart that God has given them to reach this particular place. Uh, the, the, the desire they have to see the people that live there come to know Jesus and for churches to be established. And then that really a vision trip then is, is meant to be a, a place where the people can go and, and just pray and ask God, would you have us to be a part of what you're trying to do here in this place? And so I've been on vision trips before. About a year ago, right before COVID hit, uh, uh, Simon Escarino and I had the, the privilege to be able to go to Mexico with a few other pastors and church leaders on a vision trip uh, to look at a potential partnership with a church planter in Mexico. So we met up with some IMB missionaries there and then the local um, Mexican church planter, and they took us around to several villages, and we got to see uh, kind of what was going on there. And we saw, hey, there's no Protestant churches, no evangelical churches in these 10 villages, the thousands of people, no Protestant churches. And so they kind of served as our tour guides, right? They showed us uh, kind of what the people do. We got to meet with some of the, the residents of the communities, talk with them, the people that they were already trying to reach out to and build relationships with. We got to hear and see what God was already doing in that place. And so, you know, vision trips are a, uh, a big part. It gives us a sense of the importance of God's work around the world. It gives us a, a a sense of the importance of what we need to be, do, be doing as God's church and being put into action, right? There's work to be done in places where we live, but also around the world. People need Jesus. Uh, and sometimes these vision trips and these two, the, the, the local people are serving as tour guides in these areas help us understand it. Well, today in Ezekiel 40 through 46, we see God serve as Ezekiel's personal tour guide on a vision trip. He takes Ezekiel on a vision trip to show him the future, a future temple, a new temple, and God wants him to see what God has for them in that place and what God wants them to do to get to that place, the life that God wants them to live with him and the life that they should live as a result of knowing him. And so that's what we're going to see here in this passage. We're going to see a, a new life, a restored life, a restored life of knowing and worshiping God in his presence and seeing how that is what you and I need most and what God has for us with that. So a little bit of background history in the nation of Israel. All right, In Israel's history, there was first the tabernacle and then the temple that God designated as places where he would live with his people, where his presence would physically dwell with the nation of Israel. And so it was hugely important, right? Israel was a nation that was called out by God, chosen by God to be his people, his holy people, set apart for him, living for him, but ultimately living for him because they had him with them. He, they had his presence, and that would make all the difference in the world. The main purpose of the tabernacle and then the temple was for God to live with his people. And when he lived with his people, it changed their whole perspective. They knew the, the sovereign, powerful God of all was with them. I mean, imagine the most powerful person you can imagine with you. You would feel indestructible. You would feel like you could do 
things. You could really live and not be fearful, not live in worry, right? And so all these things, when God lived with his people, that's what it, it gave them. And it made all the difference in how they lived. And they could know God. They could have peace and know that he was guiding them. His presence wasn't just there for them to look at. He was actually a personal God guiding them, speaking, communing, communing through prophets, through priests, spoke his word. They could know him. And, and, and we see a picture of that in Exodus 33. When Israel comes out of Egypt, they're in the wilderness, uh, and God is giving them the law. If you remember, Moses goes up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And what do the people do? They, they build the golden calf, right? And they start worshiping this idol. And when they come down, God says to, to Moses um, that he is going to not go with them into the promised land because they have worshiped this idol. And Moses, here's, here's his response. He says, God, if your presence does not go with us, don't send us. I mean, here they are. They've been in slavery for, thousand, or for hundreds of years, and they have this great future ahead of them, a new land, not slavery, and Moses said, I don't want to go there. I want to go back to, I'd rather go back to slavery than go to a land where you are not. That's how much God's presence meant to Moses. He knew how important it was. And what, what we've seen in Ezekiel is Israel is back in that place. They are in a place where they've been taken away from Jerusalem. The temple's been destroyed. God's presence is no longer physically with them in the sense that it was when the temple was there. And so this would have been absolutely crushing to the people of Israel, right? God has left them where, where they found, they, they felt secure and like they could do things before with God's power with them. Now they don't know what to do, right? There's insecurity, there's fear, there's uncertainty. And so this would have been crushing to them. And they are feeling hopeless. But the last few weeks, we've seen in Ezekiel, things are looking up. In chapter 37, we saw that God promises to create a new people from a dead people, right? To give them life. In chapters 38 and 39, last week, we saw that God promises to, to give them a security. That he would give them victory, uh, ultimately, over their enemies, right? People who are opposed to him as they try to follow him. So things are looking up. And then this week, we see that there is a new life with his presence that awaits them and with this picture of this new temple. Now, let me say uh, from the start that this is a passage that Bible scholars uh, differ on. They, they have, it's one of the most difficult things to interpret as far as coming to a common understanding of what exactly this is going to look like in the future. So I'm just going to mention four different ways people interpret this and then talk about how we should think about it, all right? First thing is, some people are going to interpret this new temple as a literal rebuilt temple with Israel living in that land in a future, future millennial kingdom on earth. A literal thousand years with this temple present. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that some people see it as a symbolic description of what it's going to be like when God's presence is with his people after Jesus comes in the new covenant age. And so... That would be like for us today, right? In a sense, we are experiencing a taste of, of this new temple and what God offers through it. A third interpretation is others think that it may refer to a picture of the new heavens and the new earth when, when, that Jesus will establish when he returns from heaven to reign forever with his people. This is a picture of what it's going to be like in the future for every follower of Jesus when Jesus comes back and defeats Satan and evil once and for all. And then fourth, a final interpretation is that it's both literal and symbolic. That there will be a literal temple, but it will only be a partial fulfillment of this temple that Ezekiel sees. But it's also symbolic of what God's presence will be like with his people through Jesus. So let me just say, it's okay to have a different interpretation of this. Godly people can come to different conclusions on what exactly this is going to look like. And it's not up to us to try to make the future happen, right? We are called to live by faith in God, knowing that what he says is true, even if we don't understand everything perfectly now, what that's going to look like in the future, we do know some spiritual realities that are true now 
that God does want us to know. And so the main point of what we're going to see here, I think that God wants us to understand, however we interpret what this is going to look like ultimately, is that right now, God wants every single person, he wants you to know that he desires you to live with him, and he promises to live with those who follow him and who trust him by faith. Right? What matters right now to us is not trying to figure out the future. It's trusting God now, living with him by faith, believing his word, and holding on to what he says. The vision of the new temple establishes that the Lord will return. He will return to his place at the center of his people. And it will bring great blessing on those who are with him. And so God wants us to experience that. He wants to know and see his glory and his beauty, to have a greater desire for it, seeing that this is what God has for us. If we would just look to him. And so two big truths I think that God wants us to, to take away from this temple vision today as his people, this vision of this new temple. First thing is God desires to give you a new life knowing his presence. How many of you all feel like you live in God's presence as much as you possibly could? Right? What we do, what we need is a reminder, this is what we need. Let's pursue it, right? The temple and the tabernacle in the Old Testament, as I said, they represent God's presence with his people. And he is inviting Israel with this vision to live with him again. And today, that's what he wants in your life. He wants you to live with him, to know more of the fullness of who he is. In chapters 40 through 43, we see God take Ezekiel on a tour of this temple. God is Ezekiel's personal tour guide. And we are going to go on tour with him. And we're going to see exactly what Ezekiel sees and why it matters. You may say, well, look, listen, God showed Ezekiel this tour 2,000 years ago. What does this have to do with me? And the answer is, this is for all of God's people. And what Ezekiel saw can give you hope. And it can give you meaning. And it can give you a new life of God. And so starting in verse 1 of chapter 40, as we read a minute ago, uh, it's the 25th year of exile. Can you imagine 25 years feeling far from God? And it's the 14th year after Jerusalem has been captured, the temple destroyed. And that's when God brings Ezekiel in this vision back to uh, Jerusalem, to this high mountain. Verse 3, we see the tour guide is actually a man whose appearance was like bronze, likely an angel. And he has measuring instruments to give a picture. He's going to be measuring things along the way. We're not going to, don't worry, we're not going to read all the measurements. Uh, but the, the, the point is, the measurements are meant to show this great, the great size, the vastness of what God is doing and where his people will be. God is a big God. And then we see in verse 4 that Ezekiel has a mission with this vision. It says this, He spoke to me, Son of man, look with your eyes, listen with your ears, pay attention to everything I'm going to show you, for you have been brought here so that I might show it to you. And then he says this, Report everything you see to the house of Israel. And we need to first stop there and just realize there's a lot of truth just in that statement for every follower of, of God. That what we see of God, what he shows us, the truth about who he is, we are all called to report that to people. People need to know what God has revealed to us through his word about his son. And so we see Ezekiel has that specific calling. And so the vision tour begins. And we're going to highlight important stops along the way of this vision tour and what they mean, all right? So the first stop we see on the tour in verse 5 of chapter 40 is a wall surrounding the outside of the temple, basically the wall of the city, right? Now there was a wall surrounding the outside of the temple, it says. The tour begins at the main east gate of this wall in the outer court. And so we see that the, the tour guide takes Ezekiel through this gate, this elaborate gate, 
And so why, why the emphasis? Why mention a wall? Why mention a gate? Well, I think right away we see there is a specific way that people must access God's presence. There's one way. Only people who have been made pure, who have permission to enter, whose sins have been made clean, are allowed to enter the gate and to approach God and to be in his presence. We live in a world where people don't want to say, well, there's only one way to get to God. There's all kinds of ways you can get to him. You just got to believe that there is a God or some kind of God, or some kind of higher power. But we see throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, this is way before Jesus came on earth, right? There's a, a, a one way in to God's presence. And we know that this is ultimately possible only through Jesus, only by his sacrifice. Are we made clean to be able to enter God's presence? Only by faith in what he has done for us and trusting him because of his sacrifice on the cross can we come before God. If you don't know Jesus, if you're not following him, you cannot come to God. The, the gate is shut. He opens it. Jesus is the gate to accessing God and approaching him. So we see that's the first stop, a uh, uh, deep symbolism, right? The second stop, Starting in verse 28 of chapter 40, Ezekiel's guide them, then leads him into the inner court of the temple area. Now, in the temple, the inner court is reserved for priests. And priests in this area prepare sacrifices, everything needed to properly sacrifice and approach God. They're moving closer to God's presence, and they would be preparing themselves to see God through sacrifices, through the things that they have to do. And we see here that God has left nothing to chance. He reminds us in this picture of the inner court that he gives us, just like he gave the priests, everything we need to enter his presence, everything we need to approach him, to prepare ourselves, to hear from him, to know him, to make ourselves ready. Jesus offers you full access to God. He doesn't withhold anything. He gives you everything you need for this life to know God. If you have Jesus, you have God's spirit living in you who guides you into his truth. If you have Jesus, you have God's word, which God helps you to understand where God reveals his truth to you and speaks to your heart. God makes himself available to know and he has given us full access to him. And God calls us to make the effort to prepare ourselves to hear from him. It doesn't happen automatically. Sin keeps us from God. We must prepare our hearts. We must come before him in repentance. That's how we prepare our hearts, brokenness over sin, knowing that we can hear God and see him and he will forgive our sin. So this is God, the giver of life. We must prepare our hearts to look to him so we see the next stop on the tour, chapter, the end of chapter 40 and end of 20, chapter 41. They are continuing going in, but they're also going up. It's, they're continuing upstairs to this tall rise, further closer to God. And the next stop is the temple building itself. They go in the temple in this great hall, this great sanctuary, and further in eventually to the most holy place. And as they go further in, it gets narrower and narrower, right? Again, reminding us there's only one way, and it's a narrow way to God, only Jesus. It's a picture of what it means to, to know God, how we can know God. And there, in this temple, there is all this beauty. There's decoration. There's expensive wood paneling. There's oasis-like palm trees. All these things representing uh, God in different ways and his, his presence, his blessing. And then we see there's cherubim who are attending to him. The, the power of God demonstrated. He has power over the armies of angels in heaven. And so in a time when no temple existed, Ezekiel seeing all these beautiful things representing God and what he gives, it would only serve to increase his hunger to know God, to be with him. For his presence for the blessings of God on his life. Walking with him, 
knowing God wants to give these things to him. And the key to knowing God more, we, we realize, and what God realized with Ezekiel is we need to see what we're missing and have a desire to know him more. It's something that moves us closer to him. And God is, is there. We know God is there. He's available to us. We have to remember how glorious he is to want to draw near to him. That's why we don't experience God's presence in the maximum amount that we think we can all the time. I didn't see anybody raise their hand earlier when I said, how many of you all are experiencing God's presence? Most of you think you can. Why is that? Well, God's there. It's on us. We're not drawing near to him in the way that he wants us to. And this is what his grace gives us, this desire, this hunger for God. What Ezekiel saw with his eyes, this decoration, this beauty of God, that's what grace shows us. The gift of Jesus, his love on the cross is so much more beautiful than the decoration of a building. It demonstrates so much more God's power and his blessing on our life, his love for us than a building. So we must see God's grace offered to us and want more of it. Draw near to him. So we see a picture of that in the temple. God's presence, this is what it is. It's love, it's blessing, it's grace. Then we see the tour is completed in chapter 42 as they go out of the temple, back to the outer court, back to the main east gate. And we see this kind of it summed up in verses in verse 20 of chapter 42. It says this, He measured the temple complex on all four sides. It had a wall around it 875 feet long and 875 feet wide. So about three football fields wide and long to separate. And then, then we get this, the, the last line, to separate the holy from the common or the unclean or the non-holy. The whole complex is for people to meet with God, but only for people who love God. There's a difference. Those who have been made holy out of their love for Christ, who, who he has made holy, and those who don't want anything to do with God, want to do life their way, they're outside the wall. There's a wall there. But something is missing in this beautiful complex. Did y'all catch what might be missing? God. There's this beautiful building, but God was not there at this point. And without him, without God, the building is meaningless. It's just a building. The life without God, even a good, comfortable life with nice things, maybe that's your goal in life, to have nice things. Can't get much nicer than what we just read in this building. It's meaningless without God there with them. It will not fulfill. It is empty. And then after this tour, God does come. And he completes the vision. He fills the emptiness. God's glory, his presence returns. In chapters 10 and 11 of Ezekiel, we saw Ezekiel had this vision of God coming out of the temple and leaving out the east gate, going off to the east. And it was a heartbreaking thing for Ezekiel to see and then have to communicate to, to the people, that God has left us. God was no longer living with us. And maybe some of us feel that way. Like, we don't know if God's with us. And that's a scary place to be. But now we see in Ezekiel 43, verse 2, let me read that for us. And I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east, coming back from the way he left, his voice sounded like the roar of a huge torrent, and the earth shone with his glory. Do you get a picture of, of how big this is? The glory of the Lord entered the temple by the way of the gate that faced east. And then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the inner court. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Ezekiel had seen God leave to the east. Now God returns from the east to live with his people again. They can live with God. This changes everything for them. When they felt far from God, God came back to them. 
This is a picture of what Jesus has done for us. When we feel, from God, feel far from God, Jesus comes to us so that we can know God. Will we accept him back? Will we choose to live with him? And Ezekiel falls face down in awe, in worship, seeing what God is offering him, his people. Verses 7 through 9 of chapter 43, God speaks and declares his return is permanent. Verse 7, I will dwell among the Israelites forever. This is a great hope and assurance. God will live among his people forever. He will never leave them again. But it's also with God's presence comes a great responsibility. Because if God is going to permanently live among his people, then his people have something they must do. They have to live with him. They have to have a desire to know him and to obey him. To be purified, to be made clean of their sin. Because God cannot live with sinful people. So we think about this, we see this picture, and first of all, we need to realize God doesn't offer us, doesn't offer you his presence for you to just take it for granted. God didn't offer his presence to Israel to come back to the temple for them to, to just say, oh, yep, there's God over there, right? That's, that's not what he wanted. God offers you his presence so you can walk with him, so you can know the blessing of obeying him and turning from your sin and seeing him make you holy, changing your heart, seeing God work in your life. He's called you to obedience and to know him. Is that what your life is about? That's what we see in this vision of this temple, everything God offers, but we have to choose, is my life gonna be about him? Do I want to live with his presence in my life? If it isn't, God offers you now a chance to turn away from your life without him. Repent of that. Repent of your sin without him. Turn to him. Walk with him. So after we see Ezekiel, uh, see this vision of this new life, this picture of life with God, we see God then in chapters 44 through 46 show what it produces in their life when they walk with him. And he does this by showing them a, a tour of the people in the temple and a call to new worship. And that's what we see secondly. God desires to give you a new life worshiping him. The natural result of knowing God, of seeing him, is a desire to worship him. My life glorifying God. If I don't want to glorify God, I don't have the life he wants to give me. I'm not there. But if I know God, if I know who he is, if I know what he's done, I will want to worship him. Everything about me. And I'm not there yet. You're not there yet. But we want more to glorify God in our bodies. So God wants your experience of him, his presence, to cause you to live a life of worship. Notice at the end of chapter 43, after God returns, in, in 43, if you have your Bibles open, you can see the, uh, the uh, headline or the, the main point before a section of scripture, right after God returns, what's the scripture say? The, the topic, the altar, right? The altar is the place where sacrifices were made to worship God. God's glory returns and it immediately turns their attention to the altar to worship. While Ezekiel's face down, God has to pull him up and he sees the altar. God says in, in verse 10 of chapter 43, he gives this description of this new temple. Why? In verse 10, it says this of chapter 43. It says, As for you, son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel so that, here it is, so that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, so that they may be ashamed of their sin. They see the beauty of God's temple and they realize their sin is keeping them from this. Why? Does God want them to just live with guilt? To feel bad about themselves? Hold it over their head forever? No. God knows that when they see his beauty, and they see how their sin is keeping, him from, keeping them from him, it's going to produce a humility 
and an even greater appreciation for God's grace and making it available to go in that gate and know him. And it's going to result in a greater desire to worship him when they do know him. Because they know how far God has brought them. And that should be their goal, to worship him. And what Jesus brings to you, when you see his forgiveness, when you see what he's done hanging on that cross, grace to you when you are far from him, lost in sin, when you see what God's done, the only thing you can do is worship. That's it. And so in chapter 43, we see the altar, how God is going to purify his people so they can know him and worship him, set themselves apart for him, and serve him. In chapter 44 through 46, how God is to be worshipped by his people is made clear in a, a few people, a few different images that we see uh, God show Ezekiel. The redeemed and forgiven people of God will be a worshiping people. They will worship the one who bought their pardon. And God must, but, but God must be worshiped in the way he prescribes. We can't worship God in a way that we think is good. God tells us how he deserves to be worshiped. Because the truth is, if we try to make up in our minds how God deserves to be worshiped, It'll really be all about ourselves. We'll do what we want to do. But God tells us, no, this is what I deserve from you because of my sacrifice for your behalf. And so he describes it in three ways with three different types of people. Priests, offerings, and feasts, and a prince. Three different images, people, um, things they can do. First thing in chapter 44, we, we see worship of God expressed through priests that Ezekiel sees. And the idea is this, worship comes down to doing God's will, to doing what God wants. That is a way we worship him. Obedience is worship. Priests are called, ultimately in the Old Testament, to live for God. They're called to draw near to him and to obey God by, by making these spiritual sacrifices, physical and spiritual sacrifices, proclaiming the truths that God tells them to proclaim. That's obeying him, doing his will, and leading others into worship of God. They worship, priests worship God by doing his will in all these ways. In Christ, the New Testament tells us every follower of Jesus has been made a priest. If you follow Jesus, forgiven of your sin, you are a priest. And you are called as a priest to do God's will. And you draw near to him. And you make spiritual sacrifices as an act of worship to him. And how do we make spiritual sacrifices today? We don't cut up a bull and throw blood everywhere. That's not what we do, right? What we do is we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, Romans 12, serving him. Pouring out our hearts to serve God any way we can in our bodies and anything else we can do. We give thanks and praise to God. Hebrews 13, 15, that's a spiritual act of service and worship. It's acts of love for God's people and others, ministering to other people. is how we obey God's will, serving him as a spiritual sacrifice, Philippians 4, 18. Those are just a few examples that we sacrifice our lives as worship to God, not for personal gain, not for recognition, but for Jesus' glory to honor him, to worship him. So we see chapter 44, worship symbolized through the activities of the priests, and we are called to do these things. Chapter 45, we see worship described through making fair dealings with other people and offerings and feasts. And the point of all these things, showing these, these festivals, these offerings that are offered up to God, is that God deserves what comes first in our lives. God is first. We give him the best of what we have. We don't give the best to our family. We don't give the best to our loved ones, the people we love the most. We give the best to God because he bought us. He's redeemed us. He's given us freedom from sin. We are free in him. The point is that God deserves our best when it comes to how we treat others. We relate to other people. 
Are we giving God our best? When it comes to our time, our money, what we love, what we desire, everything in our life, is God getting our best? A worshiper of God considers him first and foremost in all we do. This is what God deserves. Then we see in chapters 45 and 46, so we, we've seen the priests, we've seen these offerings and these festivals representing God deserves our thoughts, our attention, our affection, everything from us, first and foremost. Then we see a prince introduced in worship related to this prince. Now, in this passage, this prince is this mysterious figure. Nobody really knows for sure who he is. Some say he represents Jesus, but then we also see the prince making sacrifices for his own sin. Jesus never sinned. So is this prince Jesus? We don't know. Probably not, but it, it does represent a leader of God's people, right? And unlike the past leaders in Israel's history, we've seen already the shepherds of Israel, they failed them. They led them into sin and away from God. And so what we see here is a future leader that God is going to give to his people who would lead God's people faithfully, in a trustworthy way to worship God. Someone who would lead them to worship God more faithfully. Because he is the one making sacrifices, helping them to, to know God. And we know, ultimately, Jesus is the perfect prince of peace. right? He's the prince of peace who leads us, who gives us peace with God so that we can worship him, so we can come before him and know him. But we also know that we need each other in our own worship of God, don't we? In the sense, we are all called to be princes, just like we are called to be priests. In 1 Peter 2, we are called, God's people, his church, are called a royal priesthood. That's imagery that says priest and king. Royalty is king, prince. We are kingly priests. And what do kings do? We lead each other to worship God. People need you for them to worship God more faithfully. This is God's church. This is a picture of the church. How are you helping others worship God? This is our calling. This is who God made us to be. We need others to encourage us when we're down, to bring us and cause us to look to Christ who has power to restore and heal. We need others to bring edification to our souls, to, to build us up in Christ. We need others to use their spiritual gifts for the good of the body so that we can worship God more faithfully with our lives as we leave and go to our, our workplaces and our homes and our neighborhoods and our families. We are discipled by followers of Jesus to make disciples of Jesus. And this is how the worship of God grows. And so we see a picture of that with this prince leading worshipers of God to God. We are called to do that with others in our lives, and we need others to do that for us. This is why we must gather with God's people, why we need God's people in our life. We will never worship God in the way he intended if we choose to live distant from Christians, away from his church. So we see how life with God produces a greater worship of God and calls us to be a part of that. And so we must pursue knowing him. We must pursue worshiping him. And like Ezekiel, we see this tour that Ezekiel's been on, and you now have been on this tour of a life that God wants you to have. You've seen it. We've, we've seen it today. God wants this to be your experience. His word has taken us on a tour. You've seen a glimpse of God living with his people, the glory of it, the beauty of it, his people worshiping him. Does your heart want to worship God like this? God is showing you where you really stand. How much do you really desire God? How much do you really want your life, every aspect of it, to bring worship to him? But here's, we, here's the thing. This, this vision of this new temple God doesn't want you to wait for it. He wants you to live with him now. 
You will live with him one day perfectly if you are a follower of Jesus. But God wants you to taste that now, to worship him now. Don't wait. Jesus is the perfect temple who has come to us to allow us to, God, to live in God's presence right now here today. So first, do you know God? Do you know his presence in your life? Have you entered his presence through Jesus, through faith in him, trusting in him alone to forgive your sin and, and bring you to God? That's how you enter into the presence, but you don't stop there. You live with him. You know him. You come to know him. You spend time with him and you worship him. If you do know God, are you continuing to live in his presence? Not being satisfied with one time meeting him, but living in his presence with his people, with his word and prayer. Does your life worship him as he deserves? God is calling us deeper in, deeper in. And that's what this vision of the temple is meant to show us. There's no greater privilege, there's no greater blessing than life lived with God and for God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this vision of what you have for us through Jesus. This great offer that you make, a new life, a purpose to worship you. Why we exist, why you made us. Help us to not miss that in any way. Help us to keep pressing into you, into your presence, knowing your glory, seeing the blessing of your glory, the joy. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. And you invite us to that. Lord, if there is anyone here who does not know the joy of your presence, reveal to them their need today. Give them eyes to see it, to run towards it. Father, we thank you, we worship you, be honored in our response to your word. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing and respond. If you don't know God's presence in your life, we would love to, to help you know that God can, wants to live with you. He invites you to him, forgiveness, and a new life. We'd love to talk with you afterward. And just take some time as we sing to respond to God, bringing your worship to him, committing worship to him.
God has given to us. Let me just mention, uh, this month we are uh, collecting a special offering, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. 100% of this offering goes to support North American missions, church planting, missionaries relief, uh, send relief organizations. We also have summer missionaries. So one of our own, Corey Estep, is going to be going to New York this summer as a summer missionary uh, to serve with church planters there. So let me encourage you to consider giving to this offering. Uh, Our goal as a church is $3,500. And uh, again, every bit of that goes to missions here in North America. Also, if you'd like to give uh, just uh, an offering to support the church and the work of the church and our partnerships, you can drop any of your offerings off in the boxes as you leave uh, by each door. Um, Also, I want to mention in a couple weeks, Saturday, March 20th, we're going to have a student uh, youth ministry event here at Safe Harbor, 9 a.m. to noon. Uh, We've invited some other youth groups to come as well. Um, Kind of there will be several messages, some discussion groups, some worship, uh, that, uh, live music that uh, Brandon is going to be leading for us uh, that Saturday. So um, if you have a, a student, middle school, high school student, invite friends. Uh, if you are a student, invite your friends. We'd love for them to be here. The gospel is going to be presented clearly, and I think you'll be encouraged by the messages. Uh, tonight, also, the youth are meeting at 5 o'clock downstairs. Make sure you look at the bulletin for other opportunities to connect, small groups, our, our D groups, our Sunday morning Bible study, Wednesday night, we have preaching and prayer time here. Uh, uh, we're starting to have more and more opportunities again to be able to, to be involved and get to know other believers, live in community, growing together. Um, so let me just close us out with Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. God's word says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in light of what we have just seen, the new temple that God offers, since we have a boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, He has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider uh, one another in order to provoke one another to love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us draw near, let us know God, let's encourage one another as we worship God. Thank you all for worshiping with us. Good to see you all today. Oh, yep, never mind. I forgot to mention next Saturday we're having a work day to help clean up the outside of the church, rake leaves, pick up, do whatever we need to do. So 8 o'clock next Saturday, meet in the back parking lot. All are welcome. Or across the street. Back parking lot across the street, either one. We'll be here. All right.